Welcome to this video on advanced analysis. My name is Mark Jenkinson and I'll be talking about factorial designs and interactions. We're going to look at a specific scenario in order to make things concrete, but actually what we're talking about is very general and applies to many different situations. The particular example that we're going to look at is a multi-sensory investigation, specifically looking at the combination of vision and touch. And so that is something where we might be interested in does having some visual stimulus make you less sensitive to touch or more sensitive to touch depending on whether you're distracting somebody with the visual one or actually whether you're focusing attention by using the vision and so these are ways of looking at what are the interactions between these different kinds of experimental uh, stimulation and so it's quite often that we want to look at this kind of study, and it might be in the context of doing a task fMRI, which is what we're going to look at here, but actually factorial designs come up in all sorts of situations for diffusion imaging and structural imaging and other kinds of functional imaging. So it's a very general kind of um, thing to get a handle. So we're interested in looking at areas which might respond to either of these two things independently, vision and touch, but also how do they combine together? What happens where we've got areas which are responding to both and are they responding sort of more strongly or less strongly than, than we'd expect when we've combined them together? And specifically, we're going to look at how to formulate that with regressors and a thing called contrast masking. So let's first of all, formulate something very simple. Say that we've got vision um, and we've got stimuli associated with vision and then we've got some tactile stimulation, things associated with touch. And our experimental design is as you can see on the right hand side here. So we've got a period where there's just rest or baseline where neither uh, of these stimuli are being presented. Then we've got a period where we're presenting the visual one but not the tactile one. Then we've got one where we're not presenting the vision but we are presenting the touch. And then we've got one where we're presenting both. And then we just repeat this design over and over. It doesn't have to be in that order. It can be in any order, as long as you cover the different categories where you've got neither of them, where you've got just one of them, and when you've got both of them. So as long as we're covering that, the order of the experiment is not important. If we set up our EVs like this, so one is associated with all the times when the visual stimulus was on, which is EV1, the other one is associated with all the times that the tactile or the touch-based stimulus was on, which is EV2, then we can already analyze our experiment and we can ask some simple contrasts. A one zero contrast, which you can see they would ask about when do we see activation related to the visual stimulus, which is greater than our baseline. A zero one contrast would ask about when do we see activation related to the tactile stimulus greater than baseline. Or we could put differential contrasts in, a plus one minus one contrast, which would ask when do we see a stronger response to the visual stimulus than we see to the touch based stimulus, the tactile one. But what about the areas where we're seeing a response to both vision and touch? Well, you might think that a plus one plus one contrast would answer that question, but it doesn't. It simply asks the question of when do we have an average of these two which is greater than zero or greater than our baseline. And the average could be greater than the baseline simply because one of them is very strong and the other one is zero still. So one of them might not shift off baseline but the other one might shift off it by a great amount and the average would still show that there is an increase. And so this one one contrast is not selective for the areas where we know that both of them are significantly different to the baseline. So we need to formulate that kind of question in a different way. And that's where contrast masking comes in. So contrast masking is the way that we set up questions of the form, do we see a response to this and that, A and B. Now we've looked at F contrasts before, and they ask a different question. They ask, when do we see something related to A or to B or to both? And so they're very much an or type of situation. We're asking about any combinations. Here, we're asking about the and combination. Where, 
only show us areas where we know that we're getting a response to condition A and condition B. So in this particular example, vision and touch. And contrast masking is very easy to set up. Within the FSL software, in the feet GUI, if you go to the Postats tab, there's a little button called Contrast Masking. If you select that, you get a panel which pops up, which asks you which contrast do you want to mask with which other contrast. And so if we've set up our design like you saw before, such that Contrast 1 was associated with Vision, Contrast 2 is associated with Touch, then I just want to mask one of them with the other. So I can mask Contrast 1 with Contrast 2, or I could mask Contrast 2 with Contrast 1. The significant voxels that I get as a response of that as a response to that test will be exactly the same. There'll be no difference. And so it doesn't matter which way round it is. It will display slightly differently because it will show you slightly different numbers within the active region, but the active region itself will not differ at all. So in terms of finding out what areas of the brain are active, it doesn't matter which way round you set this these contrast masking things up. And that will formulate the question of when do we see something related to contrast one and contrast two. In this case, contrast one corresponds to vision, contrast two corresponds to touch. And so that's one way that we can set this up. There's another thing that we could do with contrast masking, which is very useful as well. So imagine that we've also set up a third contrast and our third contrast was a plus one minus contrast, plus one minus one contrast. That is when is vision greater than touch. And so that's interesting. We can look at different areas and we can see areas where we have a, a stronger activation to, to vision than we have to touch. But actually, we don't necessarily know that that's because vision is very strongly positive and the touch is zero or not. All that we know is that there's a difference between them which is positive. And that difference could be because vision was very positive and touch was zero or not very positive. Or it could be that vision was mildly positive and touch was negative. Or it could be that vision was actually the same as baseline and touch just happened to be much lower than baseline. And these kind of deactivation conditions are situations where during the period of the stimuli, you actually have less activation measured than you would do during the baseline conditions, happens in certain areas of the brain. It certainly happens in areas which are, care about attention, because during the rest period, that those brain areas are alert to what's coming next. Whereas actually when during the process of the stimulus, they're not. And so we often want to differentiate these things. In this particular case, it may not be super interesting, but this kind of splitting up that kind of difference and finding out whether it is definitely because there's a difference because vision was very positive is something that we want to know about. And contrast masking can, can be used to do that. If we mask contrast three with contrast one, then that tells us that. That tells us when do we see a difference and also we see a significant result to the visual stimulus. But we could make it a little bit less strict and say that well we don't need the visual stimulus to have achieved significance on its own. It doesn't have to be that much greater than baseline. We're quite happy for it just to be positive. And that's what the, the button at the bottom of this little window is. Mask using Z greater than zero. And that simply says, okay, my masking condition is not so stringent. I'm just going to say that C1 doesn't have to be significant anymore. It just has to be positive. I want to only see results from C3 where I've got a positive difference between vision and touch only in the conditions where vision is positive. And so that is a good way of breaking down these kind of differential contrasts into different parts and getting a better understanding of what's driving those particular uh, differential contrasts. In this situation, as I said, maybe not the most interesting, but certainly that, that comes into effect in a lot of different cases where you don't know which way round um, that particular difference has been formed. Okay, so contrast masking is really useful for us to ask these kind of and questions and for splitting up these differential contrasts. That's two things that we can use it for.
But that's only one of the things that we might want to look at. If we've got our factorial design, we could ask about where, what regions of the brain are responding to vision and to touch. But there's more interesting things that we can ask than that as well. So imagine our factorial design, I've split it up as a two by two. Now you might be familiar with those kind of ANOVA style uh, analyses, and this is a, a case. Two by two ANOVA is related to these kind of designs. If you have not heard of ANOVA before, that's fine. It's not that important, but it might be helpful if you have had that connection before this, that might help you understand the link. The concept here is that we've got, you know, two by two array of different conditions. So we could have neither of the stimulus present, we could have one of them only, or we could have both stimuli. And what happens is if we've got both of them on, there are different situations that might occur. So that's termed the interaction. So imagine that vision on its own compared to the baseline where neither of them were, were on. Uh, present is what is measured by the red bar here. The green bar measures the difference between what we measure in the touch condition versus the baseline. The baseline being where neither of them is on. And then what happens in the condition where both of them are on? Well if there's no interaction effect what we would expect to see is this which is that we just add the two together because it was just a set of neurons some of them were processing vision, some of them were processing touch. When you had both of those inputs coming in, then you simply had two different populations and they were uh, just adding up. That's one of the ways that you can think about the no interaction effect. It doesn't necessarily happen like that biologically, but no interaction simply means it's additive. The two things together, added together, explain the measurement that we make. So no interaction certainly doesn't mean that, that when you've got both of them on, you don't have any extra activation. You do. It's quite a lot bigger than it is for either one on its own. But it's exactly equal to the sum of those two. So when they just add linearly together, and that explains what's happening when both of the stimuli are present, then that's the case of no interaction. But we might have a positive interaction. And in that case, what we measure is greater than the addition of the two parts. And that would be the case where we've got a region of the brain which was really interested in the fact that there were two different inputs and it was going to do something different and interesting to synthesize those two things together. It was something which was actually wired to, to process the combination of things together and, and was really responsive to that. So we can look for areas where we've got positive interaction. That's one of the things that we're often interested in. We can also look for areas where there's negative interaction. That might be in the situation where it's distracting. So, you know, one of the examples that I talked about here in this particular case is that maybe presenting somebody with a, a distracting visual stimulus makes them less sensitive to touch. And we can look at what areas of the brain were responding to touch in such a way that they had a negative interaction when the vision was turned on. And that might tell us about something about how things are processing. And that could be very interesting in the concept of trying to, say, manage pain. And so there are so, all sorts of things we, we can look at, the interactions, and they tell us something really interesting. So it's often something that we want to look at. And when we want to model these interactions within our GLM, we need to go beyond what we've just set up before. So here was what we started with. We had one EV for vision, one EV for touch. That's not enough because we've already seen that we have three bars that can all be different heights. So we need three parameters to actually explain those three different values. And every time we have a parameter, we need an EV associated with it. So what we do is we add an EV. We add an EV3, and that's a special interaction EV. And that's very easy to set up in the GUI. So you can just see the example here in the GUI pane. You just set the basic shape to be interaction and it, you would tell it between which two EVs. And what that's going to do is it's going to create an EV like we are seeing here. And effectively, that's off for all of the conditions except the case where they're both combined. So when you've got both stimuli on, then that EV is modeling something. But still, the other two EVs are also still modeling something in that case. So we are actually in the situation that we've just been talking about, where we have the height of the red bar associated with the parameter for EV1, 
the height of the green one associated with the parameter for EP2, and EP3 is the difference between adding those two up, which we've seen before, and what we actually measure in that condition. And so if we don't need anything, if there's no interaction, we just have the sum of those two, we don't need any amount of EV3, and that would be when the parameter on EV3 is zero. So when there's no interaction, we expect the parameter PE3, or beta3 if you prefer, would actually be zero. We don't need EV3 to explain things. Just adding up the other two is sufficient. When it's a positive interaction, we need a positive amount of EV3. When it's a negative interaction, we're actually going to subtract an amount of EV3. And so EV3 is very easy to interpret. The parameter associated with that is exactly the interaction we were interested in. And so if we want to set up our contrasts, they're nice and simple. A contrast for a positive interaction is simply plus one on EV3. So you can see there C3 is actually our positive interaction contrast and it's zero, zero, plus one. Negative interaction will be zero, zero, minus one. And it's as simple as that. If we want to look for these interactions, that's all we need to do. And so in summary, we've seen a few different things in this talk on factorial designs and interactions. We've seen that if we want to ask the kind of question of where do we see something for A and for B, show us these areas of the brain which I know have a significant response to condition A, and they also have a significant response to condition B, I can't just formulate a 1-1 contrast, that's not going to be enough. I need to use contrast masking to ask that kind of question. It's different from an F-test, which would ask the question, where do I see a result from condition A or from condition B or from both of those? So there are two different ways that we can ask more complicated um, questions about combining different things together. If we want to ask that and question, contrast masking is the way to, that we do it. Our factorial design will cover different combinations of the different stimulus that we, that we have the stimuli that we have, and it's also going to include that situation where both of them are on. And that's the interaction case, and we're interested in what happens often in that particular case, because that tells us something uh, nice about how these things are combining together within the brain. If we want to set that up on analysis, we set up this EV3, and that interaction, we just test that. It could be positive or negative. And we have a simple contrast, which can select out a positive interaction, and a simple contrast to select out negative interactions. And that gives us our statistical maps associated with those interaction terms.